Hi, everyone. So many festival friends here with us. It definitely feels like the holidays. But where is our snow? We are thrilled tonight to have Simi Berman here with longtime festival friend and author Vincent Pinella to discuss Leo Berman's book, The Story of a Jewish Boy. The book was written by Leo when he was 14, and it recounts the horrors and fleeting hopes of a boy and his family trying to survive the final days of World War II in Italy. Leo Berman was born in Murano in 1931. He arrived in America in 1947 when he began his studies in civil engineering program at Cornell. He and Simi were married in 1956 and moved to Israel. In 1957, they moved back to the States where he entered a six-year program at the Columbia School for Architecture and graduated in 1963. He started his own architectural firm and worked on significant projects um, in New York, including the design and rehabilitation of Fort Greene Park. In 1981, Leo Berman moved his family to a farm in New Hampshire. He opened the architectural office in Brattleboro, Vermont, right across the river, where he became engaged in many projects involving preservation of old buildings. Leo was a strong advocate for presentation and had a major impact on the face of Main Street. His work won the Vermont Award for Historic Preservation in 1992. In addition, his practice consisted of community-oriented projects involving better housing for the indigent, mental health facilities, as well as houses and buildings for private individuals. Leo died in 2003. Simi Berman was born in New York City, but has lived in the Brattleboro area for more than 40 years. She married Leo in 1956, and they lived on a kibbutz in Israel for a time. They moved to the area in the early 1980s. She is an artist who works in small scale in watercolor, gouache, and oil pastel. The paintings are all non-figurative, which allows the viewer to make his or her own ever-changing discoveries. She also illustrated two books at Grandmother's Table, Fair by Fairview Press, and Bon Natale Natale, published by Franco Maria Parini, Parnini, sorry, Panini. Um, Vincent Pinella is the author of the book Sicilian Dreams, published in 2020. His other books include the memoir, The Other Side of Growing Up Italian in America, a story collection, Lost Hearts, and the novel Cutter's Island, which received a Forward Award. He's a Pushcart nominee in short fiction and Prima Magazine set of his story collection that it calls to be included in every Italian American's library. Vincent is a graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop and a former writing specialist at Vermont Law School. He grew up in Queens and he lives in Marlboro, Vermont with his wife, Susan Sitchell. Please join me in welcoming Vincent Pinella and Simi Berman. Okay, um, well, hello. And uh, thank you, Sandy, for that um, informative introduction. And thank you for the compliments on, on both our behalfs. And thank, I would like to thank the audience for joining us. Uh, we have quite a few signed up and that's great. I'm here with Simi Berman to talk about The Story of a Jewish Boy, a memoir written by Simi's late husband, Leo. I see. So please, um, with all the people signed up, I'm hoping that there'll be uh, quite a bit of response. So please use the Q&A option. And you can also upvote the questions. And uh, we will respond at the end of the presentation. This memoir, The Story of a Jewish Boy, was written by Leo Berman in 1945 at the end of World War II when he was 14 years old, and it was about experiences that began when he was 12. It is a powerful, and I, I, that's a cliche, but it's an apropos word. It is a powerful, it is a powerful description of the near two year flight by Leo, his mother and brother, beginning at their home in Northern Italy and ending up in a refugee camp at the end of the war. The memoir describes in gripping, again, a word that I, shamelessly use in, in grip, gripping detail the period when the Burmans, with the help of their fellow Italians, hid from the Nazis lest they be captured and suffer the fate of so many Jews and non-Jews. Leo's writing shows in just stunning detail how he was caught up in the sweep of history, and not only as a witness, but as a potential casualty. 
The memoir was published this fall by Bordegara Press, and here it is. It's an iteration, an uh, iteration of the same volume that uh, Simi published uh, privately some years ago. And the Simi's, uh, Simi's volume is, uh, has the Italian title, Storia d'un ragazzo ebreo, it's basically a story of a Jewish boy. I will add that uh, the diary, um, Story of a Jewish Boy, will also be published this January by an Italian publisher called Raisha Press. And um, links to that will be, you can find in the chat along with um, other information about the book. The, uh, the, Italian, the Italian publication is just testament to the timeliness of the topic and to the, to the fact that it's going to be shown abroad to a wider audience, but also to the power of, of Leo's words. Um, before all that, I, I would like to just simply give a little historical context about the situation in Italy at the time that Leo was experienced, Leo and his family uh, experienced all this. His story began, begins in September 43 in Northern Italy. At that time, the allies, mainly Americans and British, had already begun their invasion of the country by landing in Sicily. They began pushing their way up the Italian boot in the face of German resistance. And a few months after their invasion of Sicily, Italy surrendered. And the Nazis not want, did not want to lose control of Italy. And so they invaded from the north. So we have a picture here of Italy being squeezed from the south and also invaded from the north. But wherever the Nazis had control, and this is an important point, uh, Mussolini's anti-Semitic laws were enforced with a vengeance by the Nazi occupiers, and Jews were especially at risk to be killed outright or deported to the work camps or the death camps. Leo and his mother and his brother had to devise ways to hide themselves. This was difficult enough because of their German and therefore most likely Jewish surnames, but their flight was made more complicated because Ralphie, Leo's, Leo's older brother, suffered from osteomyelitis and had to be carried on a stretcher. Their, with their lives suddenly upended and without delay, the Burmans had to flee their home in Murano in Northern Italy and devise ways to save themselves. So Simi, maybe at this point, you could talk a little bit about Leo's life in Murano and about where he came, what he came from and what it was like. Yes, well, um, the Burmans lived in um, the Obermeis or uh, Maya Alto section of Murano. Uh, within a compound of their grandfather Maximilian's sanatorium. It was surrounded by a large enclosed garden with many kinds of fruit trees. They loved to climb those fruit trees and eat the fruit of the fruit trees. There was also a greenhouse with rabbit hutches containing Angora rabbits. In fact, one time, Ralphie and Leo decided they needed to make their mother a blue Angora sweater and they painted the rabbits blue. Leo loved to hike in the hills, snow covered mountains with his father from whom he learned the basic principle of pacing oneself, going slowly and steadily to preserve energy. Mountains continued to be one of his favorite places to be. The town of Murano has a long history as a popular cosmopolitan health resort. Uh, originally, it was Austria, and later, in 1867, it became part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Part of Italy it became in 1917 after World War I. It was a reward for being on the Allied side during the conflict. It was bilingual when Leo was growing up, and a strong prevailing Austrian influence remained. Mussolini had to import Italians to Italianize it. Now, <clears throat> the Dolomite Mountains stood high above the town, and the smaller hills were covered with vineyards, fruit trees, and roses. There were covered walkways along the river Passeria, which offered nooks where one stopped for coffee and listened to the orchestras playing. It was indeed a paradise. And the boys remembered it as such in years to come, despite the enmity shown by the locals and the fact that the family had to uproot themselves and leave so precipitously. There was a large Jewish community established there from the late 19th century. The Burmans were 
um, an international family of hoteliers. They came there in early 1900s. The family prospered. Uh, one branch opened a kosher hotel named the Bellaria, and there were many international cultural figures that stayed there, including Freud, Franz Kafka, and Chaim Weizmann, the future president of Israel. The other branch was under the direction of Dr. Maximilian Berman, who presided over the sanatorium Bog Park, famous for its grape cure. Jews had more or less lived in peace there in spite of the racial laws of 1938 imposed by Mussolini. Uh, and that was until the German takeover on that fateful date, September 8th, 1943, which stirred up and released a latent destructive anti-Semitism. Here's where the story begins. Leo was, and I quote from the book, busy negotiating the exchange of comic books with a young friend on that day when he heard the news about the armistice. He thought it was perhaps, quote, the beginning of a tranquil life for himself, but he was soon to find out the dangerous reality. There was an immediate change in the atmosphere in Murano. According to Leo's account, German tanks lined the street. Italian soldiers had weapons confiscated and were hunted down by the locals, as were the Jews, and shipped off as prisoners to Germany. The first transport of Jews from the area took place at that time. Anna decided to leave Murano immediately. It was obvious that that was necessary. So she bought tickets, and decided to go to Bologna because there was the Rizzoli Institute for Orthopedic Medicine, which would be good for helping Ralph um, in his illness. Uh, so I think you're going to- oh, yeah. No, this is a good this is a good stopping point because at that point I think I could read um, we have basically have the Burmans uh, leaving leaving Murano and the only means of travel at the time was the train, so there is a very um, just stunning uh, excerpt from the book of Leo's Leo's description of getting on the train with his family and I think uh, Simi will also read a little bit of that uh, after I after I after my little um, my little um, reading, but this is a passage that Leo wrote. Uh, when the Burmans were on the train and leaving Murano. So here's Leo's voice. An hour after the train had left Murano, the city of Bolzano came into view. In the distance, I could see the rubble, and this is the first time Leo, as young man, had seen anything of war. This is the what's so stunning about this, this book. An hour after the train had left Murano, the city of Bolzano came into view. In the distance, I could see the rubble of the recent bombing. This was something new for me, and since I had never seen an aerial attack, and even less its effects. The train was by this, this point close to the bridge over the Adige River when it slowed down to stop at a small station. At the station were some ashen-faced Germans with pistols and machine guns slung over their shoulders. Two of them boarded the train. Soon word spread that the Germans were searching the train for two Italian soldiers who, in Murano, had escaped the Germans and whom they thought were on the train. We were afraid that the Germans would ask for our documents because they had, had they done this, they would have seen that we were Jewish and the matter would have ended up badly. Luckily, they only had men show their identity cards, but nevertheless, I got a chill down my spine when they came into our apartment. So the train leaves uh, leaves the station and pulls into the uh, city of Bolzano, and there's another delay. And Leo decides to take a walk around the to take a walk around the station in Bolzano. Uh, he had no I had no in inclination to say put to say put, so I took a little tour around the station. I had stepped I had just stepped away from my family when a scene that was unworthy of the 20th century, which according to some people ought to be civilized, appeared before my own brown eyes. It was this, a train composed of sealed boxcars, which usually carried luggage, goods, and cattle. This time, the goods were quite different. In fact, the cars were carrying human freight. 
It might seem unbelievable, but I can assure you that I saw it with my own eyes in the middle of the 20th century. I will explain in more detail. If you have ever seen a boxcar, you will recall that it only has one window covered with a thick metal screen. This is the type of freight train I saw. Besides that, the doors were lead sealed. I realize I, I, realize I haven't told you who these wretched people were locked up in this way. They were Italian soldiers that the Germans had taken prisoner in their barracks and now were being deported to the death camps. Besides this, I saw that some people were afraid of the German with the face of a bandit who walked back and forth on the platform in front of the train and who held a loaded machine gun under his arm like an umbrella or a walking stick. I asked a bystander why these people clutched the train windows if, and what these people who hurried, what, were, what about those people who hurried toward the boxcar were doing? The gentleman kindly explained to me in great detail. These prisoners are trying to give the addresses of their families so that those kind persons may inform their families of their situation. Furthermore, those gentlemen and ladies were also trying to secretly give them apples or a piece of bread, secretly because otherwise that soldier would be more than willing to make the gift of a bullet in the belly to whomever he saw, giving a piece of old bread to one of these poor men who hadn't eaten for many days. Uh, Leo returns to returns to the train and and the and the um, the trip begins again. But at this point, maybe Simi could read uh, uh, in the same passage that's actually on page fifty nine of the book of the difficulty of traveling with Ralphie, of the difficulties that they had, difficulties they had because it wasn't just they weren't just two people they were three people they were three people and then someone on a stretcher. So Simi, maybe you can do a little bit of a reading from the diary at that point. I returned to where mother was, and we were hurrying toward the train windows, on which leaned many of those poor soldiers who were guilty of no crime but that of being Italian. Then these people quickly moved away while I waited impatiently for the train, because I wanted to get away from that place, which had by then become revolting to me. After a long two-hour wait, the train finally came. It was not easy to board it. One couldn't even imagine getting Ralphie on it through the door, since the corridor was so crowded that one could not even pass without a stretcher. So two members of the Red Cross militia got into the train car and by forcefully elbowing their way, succeeded in opening a passage as far as the first compartment. And here they asked some young ladies to kindly get up because they had to put a sick person there. Having done this, the Red Cross people leaned out of the window and told the other two people who were standing next to Ralphie to lift the stretcher up to the height of the window. It wasn't easy because Ralphie isn't all that light. Besides, there was also the danger that he could fall because the stretcher was being handed inside at an angle through the window given that the ladder was very narrow. Throughout the operation, mother and I held our breaths. Ralphie was also afraid. The suitcase cases passed through the same way Ralphie had, and the two of us also entered, but not through the train windows. Well, yeah, so now at that point, the train is on the way to, to Bologna, where um, the Burmans hope to uh, find the Rizzoli Institute and place uh, Ralphie there for care. Simi, is that how the... the yes, that's, that's how the happened. thing... Now, maybe, maybe, Simi, you can talk a little bit about what happens after they get there and maybe a little bit of the, maybe summarize sort of the rest of the trip and a little bit uh, so we don't have to have too many spoilers here. Maybe you could summarize the rest of the trip to, to uh, and finally uh, give us the arrival of the family at Shinichita. It's a quite detailed ex, uh, explanation, but I think you can do it. Yes. Uh, Let's hope. Now, um, they hadn't realized it ac actually before they went to Bologna that Bologna had been under extremely heavy bombing already. But they got there and they were admitted and they all stayed there in the hospital with Ralphie. They stayed there for eight months and um, the bombing was extremely intense because they were trying to destroy the railway lines that enabled the Germans to take their munitions back and forth. And so 
And finally, in um, I think May of 1944, Anna decided it, after particularly severe bombing, Anna decided that they couldn't, it was too dangerous to stay there. And, um, yeah, there are big descriptions in the book of, of the excruciating uh, destruction. Uh, so let's see, I actually can read another part about that because Leo comments, and that is, um, there were firefighters who were sent to oh, yeah. put out the flames of the bombings. And it says, um, the vehicles of the firefighters entered the hall, unloaded the wounded, and left again to get others. Another firefighter arrived, and the driver got off, and I saw him cry. Why is he crying, I wondered. Maybe he has been wounded. A few minutes later, I had the explanation of his sorrow. I saw another firefighter, covered with blood, being taken out of the cab of the vehicle. When the nurse put a hand on his heart and shook his head, I understood that he was dead. The driver was looking at his companion who had died next to him while he was going through the city to rescue some wounded persons. And he was sobbing loudly. All the bystanders were moved and I was also moved, very moved. It is heartrending to see a man, a soldier cry. At that moment, the horn of a car was heard. He then pulled himself together, got into his vehicle and drove it out to make room for another vehicle with its bleeding load. The body of the firefighter was taken to the morgue. I will not forget for all of my life, those few minutes, that sobbing firefighter. I would like to praise the firefighters, but I cannot find the words. In fact, it is impossible to find them. If a soldier who kills many enemies is called a hero, how should we call one who saves those that someone else is trying to destroy? So the next destination, Anna had to think hard about where she was going to go next in, in this process of trying to steer clear of the Germans. And she thought of going to Perugia, where Fred, her husband, had gone to university. And there they had his old math teacher, she thought might be able to help them. But when she got there, uh, he was sick and wasn't able to help them at all. Uh, however, they heard about the church, the uh, Catholic church, who were providing false papers and hiding places for Jews. Actually, um, there was something even more interesting in Assisi, which had a monastery that was completely um, involved in at night when nobody they, nobody was looking and manufacturing these false papers, uh, finding uh, places for uh, Jews to hide, and just were deeply involved in in the rescue. Um, so they got. Anna and the boys got papers from, in the name of Rica Bono from Campobasso. And nobody could check about whether these papers were false or not because um, it's the south of Italy and it had been invaded already. So the church sent them to a little town on a hill nearby called Prepa. And they lived next to the church under the wing of Don Guido Macario. Leo in his disguise was an altar boy. He fed the pigs and later, after the pigs were fed, several months later, he made them into sausages. Um, he took walks around the outskirts of the town, listening to the sounds of bombardment coming from both sides, both the allies and the Germans fighting each other across the top of where they were staying. And because the bombs were falling so close to the church, Anna thought that it was really too close for comfort. So they moved to a farmer named Bel Luigi. Turns out that he was a fascist and having overheard her talking German to the boys, denounced her to the Germans as a spy. So the Germans immediately took her and decided to shoot her in the olive grove. They tied her to a tree 
and they wanted to blindfold her. What she says was, I want no blindfold. I want to look you in the eye so that you remember that look till the day you die. And then the commandant says, when the saber goes down, you will be shot. He tells the men, he tells the men that they will shoot when the saber goes down. Just then, a soldier came running, shouting, the Americans are advancing quickly. We have to leave. So they turned to Anna and said, you wait here. And that was that. The German army collected themselves rapidly to leave the area. And Anna and the boys were finally free to go where they wanted. And in, they got a ride in an English jeep going to Rome. So. So we've arrived in this in this uh, sort of the almost the end of this this flight, and we are now in Rome at the refugee camp. And the refugee camp happens to be in Cinecittà, which is the uh, famous um, movie studio. So actually, started by Mussolini to make um, propaganda films, and later later used by all the famous Italian directors for all those great post-war Italian movies. But here at um, Cinecittà, Leo was just at peace to uh, think his own thoughts, uh, study his books, and also interact with a lot of the refugees he saw uh, from other parts of Europe. So uh, Leo's, Leo, Leo's experience at Cinecittà with other refugees was uh, also part of the diary and part of his uh, part of his experience. And not to have too many spoilers, it's one of my favorite entries in the diary that um, of Leo's experience in the in the refugee camp, dated June fifth, nineteen forty five. Yesterday, five Greek girls arrived from Rhodes, who in nineteen forty four had been brought to the camp in Dachau, Germany. They live in the room next to ours. The entire camp talks about them. The things they say are horrible. I will write them down as I heard them. These women have told of how they underwent a daily two hour session of blows with a stick. Worst of all is that they told of having had to see their parents burn. Everyone felt great pity for those girls who were helped in many ways here in the camp. They were given clothes and some beds. Every day one hears about more Nazi atrocities. Let us not forget them. There's a, there's a wonderful sort of a summary that I think maybe Simi would like to read on page 38, which is sort of the some of Leo's observations of the whole experience. Um, do you know, I think, um, Simi, do you know the one I mean? It's on page 38. Yeah, it's, it's New Year's Eve, 1945. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. And that's, I think maybe that, it's, that's a wonderful little passage. I, I, right, right. At midnight, the new year begins. If I think about the year of which today is the last uh, last day, many memories come to my mind. How many people, good and bad, have I met in the year 1945? How many new things have I learned? During this year, a great transformation has taken place in me. I have known life from a new angle, but it is a very ugly angle. I have seen how great the goodness can be sometimes in people who are not related to us. And I have also seen how far the evil can sometimes go in people who are close relatives. I have seen how there is no justice in this world and how useless it is for, to hope for it. Among the good people, I can include the Christophany family, who without any advantage has tried to help us as much as they were able to. This family includes three people, husband and wife and a daughter, who was a teacher and a secretary in a gymnasio. I know her because I have studied privately with her. My mother had to stay in Netuno with Ralphie. They kept me with them for two months. And when I became ill with malaria, they took care of me better than if I had been their son. Um, I don't know if we want to read more of that. So okay. That's about it. It's just a very, a very touching passage. And I think that kind of brings us, brings us to the end of the readings and I think maybe we'll take a look at the Q&A and what, well I have just one more comment that I, I have in my notes that I want to say 
What we have here is a chronicle of the Jewish experience in the context of the war in Italy and elsewhere in Europe through Leo's contact with other refugees. By the time of Leo's arrival in Trinicita in April 1945, the war was over. Hitler would have died in his bunker and Mussolini, would, and, Mussolini and his mistress, Clara Pataki, would have been killed by Italian, the Italian partisans actually put up against the stone wall and shot. Europe was, most, most, much of Europe was in ruins and another phase of Leo's life began. So that is, that is the odyssey. And it is an odyssey in the sense that it's a trip fraught with dangers. That's, that, that takes us to the end of uh, the odyssey in Italy and then the beginning of Leo's new life, which isn't really too much part of the, part of the book. But um, let, let's take a look at the Q&A. I see we have a question from Myra Fassler. Where was Leo's father and or grandfather when Anna and the boys left Murano? Yes. Um, Leo's grandfather had died. I don't remember exactly the year, but he had died fairly early in the 1930s. Leo's father, um, after the, he had, had a chemical factory in Milano and Jews were not allowed to own property or hire people or anything. So that clearly a handwriting was on the wall at that point. And so I think he decided to leave. The family had separated them. Uh, he had left and, uh, and, uh, and the boys were on their own. So he brought his mother who was still alive, his two brothers and his sister over. They managed to get to America with Fred's help. And Leo and his brother and mother were left stranded. So that's the answer to that question. Well, we have another question, but I'm not sure if we can, how well we can answer from Robert Provone. Please tell me how to access the introductory overview read at the broadcast start. There is a reference to a bibliographical list, which I would like to acquire, and particularly the book that was referred to as a standard Italian school requirement. Oh. I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about how to answer that one, frankly. Um, so I'm going to pass on to the next from Christina Gibbons. How did these photographs survive? survive? Is there other memorabilia? I think Simi is be better prepared to answer that one? Well, Anna was a great saver. She saved everything. I even have Leo's notebooks from when he was being tutored in Greek and Latin. So, uh, and that included the, manus the little manuscript book that had the whole story of his um, war years. So um, she saved everything. I have all kinds of correspondence and um, and the photographs, I think, must have come from her as well. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Seema, how, Seema, how was the, the diary discovered? Well, Leo always had it. He always knew where it was. He always meant to translate it, but he had never gotten around to doing it. So um, it wasn't a matter of discovering it. He knew where it was. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the family discovered it. Well, I knew where it was, so I did something with it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, here we have a comment from Connie Green. Many of us whose fathers served in the U.S. military in World War II had the experience of them not wanting to talk about the war. As Leo looked back, how did he feel about speaking about what had happened? Well, that's for, that's for Simi. <laughs> that's, very good, that's a very good question. Um, well... I think he was happy to talk about the story in appropriate places to people who asked or where he felt it would be listened to. He didn't talk about it all the time. So, but it also wasn't forbidden territory at all. So I don't know if that answers the question. He was willing to discuss it. I remember actually there had once been a, a meeting in somebody set up a meeting of people who had been affected by World War II. And it was an interesting assortment of people who came together and discussed their um, 
experiences and they came from all different aspects of the war. One was even from Hiroshima. So, um, yeah. So he talked about oh. it. Yeah. You know, we have another um, entry here by Lou Pecky. In my conversations with Leo, he indicated that after the liberation, he spent some time in a youth camp in Fuji, Italy. I, three years younger than Leo, was also in the same camp, but he but could not find that episode in his book. Did I miss something? I have never heard about that. <laughs> this is this is a new um, idea to me because I had I don't think I knew about that. Well, we'll have to keep that as a puzzle. Uh, I'm going to take a look in the chat box uh, and see if there are. Um, and we enter, there are uh, entries in the chat box for how to how that we welcome questions and all that. But I have uh, people are ex I am excited about this presentation. Hello, Simi, I love your artwork. Um, but I don't see any uh, questions in the chat box, and we're pretty much uh, come to the end of. Let's see what's in the. Oh wait, right, now here we go. Jeffrey Rubin. I'm scrolling now. Learned how to do that. Jeffrey Rubin, did you learn things from the diary that you hadn't known before? And was the perspective of the 14-year-old different from the one you were familiar with? Oh, what a good question. <laughs> um, hmm. I think about that for a while. No, there was nothing in the diary that I had not known. I had heard the story before. Um, I remember the first time I heard it. Um, and yes, I think Leo became broader in his outlook about the world. I think he was still um, still in pain from what he had just endured, because after all, he had written it just having escaped all of this. So he, he definitely, definitely um, improved his view of what life could offer in terms of progress and betterment and good things. But he also kept um, some skepticism about, about it. I don't think he ever completely changed his outlook about things. I think he just tried to do the best he could with the way the world was. That's, yeah. We have a comment from Max Berman. Hi, Simi. When did Poldy, Poldy is Leo's nickname. When did Poldy write the book? Well, Poldy wrote the book in 1945. Yeah. At Chinichita. Yeah, when he was 14. And yeah, when he was 14. And here's something I actually missed. Amy Cohen asked above, did Leo ever go back to Murano or into Italy? Absolutely. Yes, he did. We did several times. Um, and... It was interesting. It's, it's still very Austrian. Um, I found it rather alien. Certainly doesn't feel like Italy. And of course, I had in my head all the things, the experiences that they had had. So that didn't put me in a particularly positive frame of mind about it. Um, we also went back to the prepo, to the church, and spoke to the priest who was there now. And um, he hadn't known about the fact that the church had hidden Jews during the war and given them helped and given them false papers. So he was very pleased to hear that and said that he would put up some sort of um, commemorative plaque. Um, I don't know if they ever did that, but that's what he said. So. Now there's also a comment from um, Skylar Gould or question how did Leo's war experience affect his life in Brattleboro hmm. well as I said I think he tried his best to be as constructive as possible to do what he could to improve whatever he saw that needed improving so yeah I just think he wanted to make the world better in whatever way he could. 
that, that is partly what he got from his experience in the war. Is well, we have some more light shed on the relation of Lou Pecky and Leo. Lou is has asked another question. Uh, we lived as refugees, meaning that he and Leo from Yugoslavia at that time, close to Leo in Rome. P.S. I also married Lenny, a close high school friend of Simi. So nice. now we're are we. You know that we know where where we're, where we're at, Simi. Yes, yeah, we we had similar terrible experiences in the war, certainly. Yeah. Okay, should I go on to the next? Did Leo from Myra Fassler? Did Leo ever reconcile with his father? Did Ralphie make it into the U.S.? <laughs> Um, question one, yes, in a manner of speaking, he did. Um, they had a civil relationship. Um, you know, we saw him fairly regularly, but it was just, uh, yeah, they were civil. Um, and Ralph, Ralphie did. Ralphie was the last to come because Leo came, then his mother, then Ralphie came. No, his mother was the last to come. Ralphie came when he was deemed cured of the osteomyelitis because they wouldn't let somebody with an illness into the countries. And so, but after the war, he was able to get penicillin. So that definitely helped. And yeah, so then he came and yeah, it was difficult, very difficult. Um, he didn't have an easy time of it, Ralphie. Um, Leo got to go to school, to college. And Ralph didn't, he had a hard time, that's all. Uh, there's another question from Gary Pitkin. Uh, could Simi talk about the process of translation of the book? Ah, yes. Well, um, we... Oh, and years back, we all, Vincent and Jerry and I and other people had an Italian class and we had a wonderful teacher named Paola. And Paola had to go back to Italy and asked if we would take in, be kind to a friend of hers. And that friend was Giuliana Carugati, who was kind of all alone in the world. And so we got to know her and she, um, when the time came to translate it after Leo had died, the book, I asked Juliana if she would do it, and and she did. And I mean, Juliana's a a brilliant scholar of Dante, and so it's just, you know, uh, it was wonderful that she was willing to undertake this project. Um, she did a beautiful job, and uh, I remember an interesting comment she had, which was that. Um, Leo was very conscious about his writing, sort of self-conscious. I think he partly wanted to be a writer at one point, and so he chose his words carefully, and she noticed that, and so that was a challenge for her to get the spirit of that into her translation. I have one, uh, another question from Kathleen Maisto. How did Leo's experience in Italy influence his architecture? Oh, well, preservation, preservation. <laughs> um, he was very interested in maintaining uh, the old facades, the old visage of the sense of, so you could maintain the sense of place somewhere that it wasn't um, overridden by everything modern. So in balance, in balance, the, the new and the old, so. Very, very another uh, another question from Jeffrey Rubin. Did you learn things from the diary that you hadn't known before? And was the perspective of the 14-year-old different from the one you were familiar with? That sounds like a familiar question, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I knew the story very well. Uh, and so I didn't find out anything new. I did, on rereading it, um, uh, wonder about some things but those are things that we didn't talk about so i mean and tonight so i won't even bother to bring them up um 
and uh, what was the other thing? Second thing? Look, uh, was the perspective of the 14 year old different from the one you were familiar yes, with? Yes, yes, he was, he, as a 14 year old, he ended up being much angrier. And um, then later in life where he, he, he absorbed it all and managed to uh, have a better philosophy about the world that was more useful. Yeah. Well, we have um, so a comment in the, in the chat box. Um, it doesn't say who it's from. Thank you for bringing this story forward, especially important given the current increase of anti-Semitism. I think that's particularly relevant, but I, I also wanted to ask you something, Simi, what, what about, um, can you talk a little bit about what Leo did with himself after Chinichita, what he did with his life before he met you? And I know you both went to Israel. Could you just talk about that a little bit about his desire to do that? Yeah. And how was it, was it affected okay. by his, so this his, is a big his experience? Question. It's a big question. Okay. So having been through the, the war uh, and, and having had to run based on his national and religious uh, situation, um, he, he felt that it would be a good thing if Jews had a, a homeland to go to, that they wouldn't be chased out all the time from whatever countries they were in or persecuted, not treated as foreigners and aliens, but to have their own place, he thought that would be, um, that would be a good thing. So he became kind of um, Zionist in his outlook. And he went to, when he went to Cornell, he joined a Zionist youth group, but he was a very serious young man. And um, he felt that all, the dancing and singing and things that they were doing. He called it child's play. He kept a little notebook and then and said that was all child's play. People should go and put their lives on the line because the country needed them. So that's why he left Cornell after two years and decided to go to Israel where he became um, a surveyor in the desert in the Negev and until he was... Um, drafted by the United States Army. Of course, he got to the United States in 47, just in time to become a citizen and be drafted into the army and it was the Korean War. So he had to come back. Uh, the Israelis wouldn't let him give up his citizenship. So he came back and he was in the army for two years and that in Virginia, he didn't go fortunately to fight um, because he had various things wrong with him physically. Uh, and so he had a wonderful time in the army, hiking in the Blue Ridge Mountains and making desk signs for the colonels there. But the point is that he also met a wonderful group of people, Americans, pure Americans who um, really admired him and whom he was very, very fond of. And I think he changed his perspective about human beings there. I mean, it. It broadened his sense of the world, definitely. So, yeah. Well, that's very interesting about Leo and what happened to him later. But we also have a, a few more comments in the Q&A. One from Betsy Smith. Did he ever go on to write other kinds of memoirs as an adult? No. <laughs> no. Lots and of letters. Ones, about those okay. Memoirs. Simple answer. No, another one from Greg Orifici. Or Fiji, I forget. I don't. I'm not sure. Did Leo's well, European well. background impact how you both gardened and created a beautiful landscape in Chesterfield? Yes. yes, Leo. Leo loved to garden. He loved to garden. He loved his vegetable garden. He loved the flower garden. It, it, he was. He loved to work in the earth. And when we were on the farm, he also was a plowman. He used to ride the tractor and plow up the fields. And now he loved it. That was, that was. Um, we have still have the, the Q and A. They keep they keep coming from Skylar Gould. Have you ever experienced anti-Semitism in Brattleboro? Not personally. Okay. Um, from Julie Raymer, 
see me please share something about your artwork that is going to be on the cover that is on the cover it is on the cover well you yeah. she want can you share something about it well i didn't design the cover particularly to go with the book it was something that i had made and um so it seemed pretty appropriate the name of it is called emerging and it's and, and it's an image of a, a young person vulnerable um emerging from a fragmented world so um the editor nick grosso and i thought that would be probably an appropriate cover if they weren't going to use photographs which they didn't want to use so that's the answer to that uh there are two questions that sort of overlap uh when did you and leo meet and how did you and leo meet <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So, um, as I mentioned before, Leo had been at Cornell and decided halfway through his studying civil engineering that it, it was all child's play and he needed to go to Israel and do something real to be helpful. So, he went, he got the job through his family. His family, um, he has a lot of family in Israel, uh, uncles and cousins and so he got a job as I think I mentioned as a surveyor in the Negev and on the ride over on the boat he met a group of young uh, people from um, a Zionist organization and he got in with them and I think he sort of remained in touch while he was in Israel with some of them or one of them and um so that when he finished his um, army service, oh yeah, I have to get back to what the question was. Uh, <laughs> he turned up at that where he knew those people from, and I happened to have been in that um, Zionist organization. So I met him for the first time in 1953. I was 17, he was 22. He had just gotten out of the army. And uh, we all were friends. And then I got to go on a trip south with him to meet his friends from the uh, that he had met in the army. And that actually is when he told me the story of his experiences in the war. And that kind of um, made for a special relationship. And that's how we met. <laughs> we have another comment uh, on the on the chat. Um... Simi, did you and or Leo talk about Leo's experiences with your son, Mark? He, I think Leo did. Yes, I think he did. I don't know to what extent, actually. Uh, there's also a, remar a question from Tom Bedell. Did the Heightstown interlude follow <laughs> quickly thereafter? <laughs> Not sure of I'm not sure about that. But what yes. is what to what is he Tom, alluding? Tom, Tom went to school at the Petty School in Heightstown. He knows that the farm where we were was oh, in okay. Heightstown. So yeah, yes, it did. Yes. Tom didn't know anything about the farm while he was at the school. <laughs> okay, I think we're pretty much come to a close here. Um I appreciate and we appreciate all the all the questions and comments. And um, uh, just a few sort of closing remarks. Um, the book is available from local independent bookstores and also bookshop.org. Uh, there will be a link. There's a link to bookshop.org in the chat box. And um, thank you for listening. Thank you for, um, I hope you all appreciated it. It's to me, it was just a incredibly moving book it, it's a, not a big long book but it is so brief and short and powerful that you it's just a, to me a must read i don't i hope it gets a wider or a wide audience thank you Simi and vincent for a compelling presentation and special thanks to jerry carboni for putting this together the link to purchase the book is in the chat and if you're also if you're planning to make any year-end donations to nonprofit, we would love to be included on that list Details of how to donate may also be included in the chat. I'm not sure, but if they're not, it's on our website. And happy holidays to all, and we will see you next year on Friday, 
January 13th at 5 p.m. Okay. Okay. Goodbye and thank you. Thank you all. Oh, thank you. <laughs>